3 initiative, which is a health and wellness initiative uh, created by Mayor Muriel Bowser to help residents lead active, full, and healthier lifestyles. And I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. It's great to have so many people on the call. Thank you for giving us uh, a piece of your Thursday evening. And we are joined today by a panel of great minds, great local experts here in the DC health space. So I wanna kick things off. I know you've been patiently waiting. waiting. We are doing this to close out Women's History Month. Um, hopefully some of you were here for us in February when we did our forum on black health and the issues concerning the community there. Uh, for March, we felt, <clears throat> we felt it would be best to bring back this format and talk about women's health because we all uh, need to get invested in that topic heavily. So without further ado, I am going to kick this panel off. We wouldn't be here 50C3 wouldn't be a thing if it wasn't for the great partnership and the great uh, work of Aetna, who has really stepped up and provided a lot of support for us in a number of ways. So I'm going to kick things over to Marcus Duckworth, who is the Vice President of Client Management for Aetna and their Labor and Public Divisions. So Marcus, take it away. Uh, thanks so much, Jason, and good evening to all of you who have taken the time to join and engage in this very important discussion, as Jason mentioned earlier. Um, I'm part of CVS Health under Aetna's local public sector and labor team here in DC. And as a health company, we certainly understand uh, the importance of not only openly talking about women's health, but also talking about what all of us can do to address women's health, especially in a pandemic environment. We would also like to thank the DC government for their continued partnership in all things health and well-being, along with the Department of Parks and Recreation, Department of Behavioral Health, Fit DC3 team, and Sky Schools as well. With that said, I'd like to now introduce the moderator for today's panel, Dr. William Blake, Director of Social Emotional Learning at DC Public Schools. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm excited. First and foremost, I'm excited just to have the opportunity to engage this amazing panel as we uh, definitely acknowledge and close out this amazing Women's History Month. Before I get started to introduce um, the panel, I would love just to provide some deeper context around Women's History Month and why we are celebrating it here um, today. Many of you all might already know, according to, um, to history.com, Women's History Month is a celebration of women's contributions to history, culture, and society. It is typically observed through the month of March. Um, women's History Month is, dedica is, is dedicated month to reflect on the often overlooked contributions of women's to the United States history, from Abigail Adams to Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth to Rosa Parks. The timeline of women's history milestones stretches back to the founding of the United States. The actual celebration of Women's History Month grew out of a week-long celebration of women's contributions to culture, history, and society organized by a school district in Sonoma, California in 1978. So that's why we are here this month and every month and every day. Women should be celebrated not just for a month, but every minute, every second, every hour of the day. You all are the creators of life. So thank you all for the contributions that you all give to society. And I appreciate and honor every one of you all that's not only on the panel, but that's also on the call as well. And just to give you a tidbit fact about me, um, I am uh, uh, I'm married to an amazing wife, and I live in a house with all women, where it's my wife and my two daughters. So just pray for me on a daily basis. <laughs> now, let me get uh, to introducing our amazing, amazing, amazing panel. First, I would like to introduce Miss Jennifer Porter. Ms. Jennifer Porter is the director of the Mayor's Office on Women's Policy and Initiatives. We also have 
Dr. Aparna Mathur, who is the medical director for CVS Health. And last but not least, we have Ms. Joanne Livenday, who is the principal sky teacher and the founder of The Joyous Leader. And she is actually going to kick us off by leading us into a breathing exercise that is going to allow us to ground our hearts and minds and to also have a sense of release from all of the exciting things that have taken on today in our personal and professional lives. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor for me to lead you back into your home today, the home called you. So let's begin to shake off the day, shake off your hands, stretch your arms, and begin to bring your attention to your body. I invite you to sit comfortably and easily with a straight spine, close your eyes. And tonight we'll be engaging in a breathing called the straw breath. You'll be breathing through your nose, and you'll be breathing out through a very small straw in the mouth. Close your eyes and let's take a deep breath. Let's take a deep breath in. And release and let go of the day. Beautiful. Breathe in. And let's breathe out through a very small straw in the mouth, slowing the breath down. Let's take a couple more straw breaths on our own, breathing in through the nose and breathing out through a very small straw in the mouth, breathing in through the nose. And slow and deep breaths through a very small straw in your mouth. Relaxing your feet. Relaxing your knees. Relaxing your thighs. Placing the total weight of your body on the seat that you're sitting on. Feel the energy moving up and down your spine as you breathe. Relaxing your arms and hands. Let's take a deep breath in again. And normal breath out. Relax your neck and throat. Relax all the muscles in your face. Placing a gentle smile on your face. We are happy you are here. Welcome home to yourself, to your body. And begin to notice that as you relax your breath, your mind relaxes and your body relaxes. Let's take another deep breath in. And release. Just take a brief moment to find a moment of gratitude for yourself for being here. We are grateful for you. What can you find to be grateful for today in this moment right now? Let's take another deep breath in. And breathe out. You may notice that your body is more relaxed. Your thoughts may be slower. You are centered. And you are ready. You are here right now. Begin to bring your attention back to your body and surroundings. Inviting some movements and your hands and feet. You want to roll your neck, stretch back, taking a deep breath in. And breathe out and release. And when you feel ready and complete, 
at your own time, at your own pace, you may open your eyes. Welcome home. Ooh, is it time to um, go to bed now? Wow. Well, thank you um, for that. Uh, I feel like that, although I am home, I feel like I'm home with myself and able to uh, release all of the trauma and the excitement and the joys and the challenges and the successes that um, have found their way to my plate on, on today. Today for this panel, um, it is dedicated just to acknowledge um, the importance of women's health as we close out Women's History Month. And there are three main themes that we are going to touch on today. Women's mental health, economic opportunity, and women's health disparities. And our amazing panelists is going not only going to share their expertise, um, but also provide some, some strategies and some tips on how to improve um, the, um, the, the well-being of women um, that are on this call. So to get things started, um, I'm going to start with Ms. Jennifer Porter. Um, as I mentioned earlier, she works in the mayor's office, um, specifically focusing on women's policies and initiatives. So Ms. Porter, can you tell us about the work that you are involved in with the mayor's office and how did this department come to be? Happy to do so and happy Women's History Month to everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, and I, I'm excited to, to greet you all and to be here tonight on behalf of our mayor, Muriel Bowser, uh, who is a fantastic and uh, phenomenal woman leader. Uh, I'm gonna share just a few slides uh, about the office and share a little bit more information. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Blake, for that uh, awesome kickoff. And thank you, uh, Joanne, for that fantastic um, opening because uh, we need that. We need, we need to center ourselves. And one of the things that is a priority for Mayor Bowser's administration is centering women and prioritizing women. And so uh, the office was created in, in an effort to empower women in the city to thrive in a few ways, um, uh, identifying opportunities and investments in the government that the office can amplify to women, making sure they know about the great work that our agencies are doing, to learn about the investments that their tax dollars are, have paid for, and to make sure that that work is centered around women. And so um, with that mission, we do that uh, in, in partnership with um, women's organizations, nonprofits, and amazing groups like Aetna, uh, who have, have committed and made investments in, in women. Uh, we do that with our sister government agencies. And we do that through three pillars, economic empowerment, civic engagement, and the reason we're here today, health and wellness. Um, we have several initiatives that are working towards um, the equity piece of how women show up in their everyday lives. And so whether that's making sure that they get uh, equal pay, which we know yesterday we um, brought awareness to Equal Pay Day for women. We actually have a class where we train women how to negotiate higher salaries and making sure that they know those tips and tactics to get exactly what they're worth and what they deserve. Um, and we also uh, partner with the amazing Department of Parks and Rec uh, under uh, the leadership of uh, Director Delano Hunter and uh, the amazing team uh, here at Fit DC on making sure that we prioritize health for women. And we know a lot of the other things that impact women when it comes to our uh, economic status, when it comes to housing, when it comes to safety, all of these things impact our health and they impact the way that we show up. And so um, we know for women who at many stages in our lives have participated in programs and uh, created initiatives and uh, participated in, in movements, but sometimes we get to that glass ceiling and we have to change the system. And that involves policy and legislative initiatives. And our office is proud to, in partnership with the great work that we're doing programmatically through our initiatives, 
to create uh, um, and to, to amplify the advocacy of women and things that we need uh, to change and, and to create policy initiatives for women. The mayor, uh, through our civic engagement initiatives, has not only uh, helped uh, to prevent and identify um, key investments that the city needs to make to break barriers, including uh, removing the menstrual hygiene tax or the pink tax for women in D.C., uh, menstrual hygiene products are not a luxury. <laughs> they are a necessity for women. And so taxing them was something, was a policy initiative that needed to change. Uh, we took that a step further. Uh, two years ago, the mayor made an investment uh, to remove the tax on diapers for families uh, in DC. And a lot of people don't know that. Diapers are actually tax-free in DC, but these are policy initiatives. And again, those system level changes and investments that we have to make that really do move the needle uh, when it comes to our health. One of the key investments uh, that, one of the key priorities for the mayor is maternal and infant health. And we work critically with our partner, sister agency Thrive by Five, to make sure that not only are we elevating the needs for maternal health in the city, but that we're elevating and giving space to the great work that's happening on the ground, making investments and sharing and amplifying the great work that our, our clinics our uh, federally qualified centers and our partners like CVS are doing to help um, bridge the gap and to, to identify uh, barriers and break down barriers and create innovation uh, and intervention for moms. So uh, I will keep it brief, uh, but just wanted to share a little bit more about our office, uh, our objectives again, with those three pillars uh, to improve the health and quality of life for women to improve uh, the economic status of women. And we also work to make sure that women are at the table and civically engaged. So we know that for us to change the world, we have to have women in leadership. I'll say that again, because it's important. If we're gonna change and improve this world, women have to be in leadership. And the way, um, the way that the mayor has aligned and prioritized civic engagement for women is so critical because we know when we empower women, we empower entire communities. Women are amplifiers and they also are conveners. And so we know that when we resource women or when we share resources with women, there's an a amplified effect. And so what does that mean? That means encouraging women to sit on boards and commissions that advise government agencies so that their voice is reflected not only at the table, but in the outcomes of the programs that are created by their voice. Um, that's encouraging women to run for office. Again, women have to be in leadership for us to change this world. Um, it looks like uh, showing women what opportunities to testify and to show up and learn about the budget process and weigh in on their voice on where they feel investments and priorities should be made with our budget and, um, and prioritizing not only, I, I talk about it as like a, a teaching someone, a fishing for someone and teaching someone to fish. So whether it's our policy priorities or not, making sure that women who are often the closest to the problem who are also often closest to the solutions, know the levers of government that they can insert them, their voices at. And for us to encourage and support them in insert, inserting their voices to make change that reflects their needs uh, and reflects the solutions that they create. Um, so that's really the heart of the, the policy piece of our work uh, because people can sometimes feel that government is bureaucratic and heavy. And our role is to make sure that not only can women uh, participate in government and, and access resources, but they're, that they're a part of, of the, the process. So uh, one thing about women in leadership, empower women, empower women. And I can't uh, talk about the Mayor's Office on Women without talking about my amazing team. Joya Matthews is our Associate Director and Alex Chambers is our Outreach Coordinator, who many of you all in the community have interfaced with her, uh, reaching out to you all and connecting with us. We also work in partnership with our, uh, our public commission, the DC Commission for Women, who does outstanding work and advises all of the work that we do. There are eyes and ears telling us about trends that are going on with girls and women in the city. And um, I'll just wrap up because we're here at Women's, <laughs> Women's History Month as we affectionately uh, call it Women's History Month, um, just claiming that space.
And um, this is really our busiest month and it's our most visible month. And so the mayor has curated some great programming all month. And I just wanted to to salute all of the DC women, women of Washington uh, and the feminist uh, men and others who support us. Uh, We continue, yes, (laughs) we continue to have a few additional programs and here's uh, the calendar. Tonight we celebrated our queer women uh, of Washington. And then on the 30th, we'll be celebrating the annual uh, Mayor's uh, Washington Women of Excellence. So with that, uh, this is our contact information. Stay connected with us at DC Mopi on all social media platforms. Um, but I look forward to this discussion with the rest of the panelists because this is a critical time for women, uh, not only in our city, but across the globe, but especially in our city, uh, women who are frontline workers, women who are government workers, women who are just trying to to make a difference in their community, who can often, we often find ourselves one uh, opportunity away from success and one tragedy away from poverty. And so we try to be that nexus in connecting people uh, to resources and and also just um, identifying opportunities to help women to thrive. So thanks so much, Dr. Blake, for letting me share. I look forward to uh, being in, in in a conversation with the rest of the panelists tonight. Yeah, Ms. Porter, thank you. Um, well, thank you for educating me on uh, MOPI, the Office of uh, Women's Policy and Initiatives. Um, it's exciting to hear that, um, you know, our mayor and our government is uh, committed to um, e- uh, elevating and uplifting the voices of women in our community. So it's, it's definitely exciting for me to hear this. And um, I would definitely be sharing this with some colleagues um, in the school system. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Doctor, moving on to Dr. Mathorn. Um, I can imagine over this past year, you have been extremely busy um, serving as the medical director of CVS Health. I don't wanna, I I can't even imagine what a a day might look like for you over this past year. Um, With that, can you just tell us a little bit about the work that you are involved in as it pertains to health equity for women? Thank you, thank you, Dr. Blake. Um, uh, Thank you for inviting us and having me here to uh, talk about this issue on uh, health inequities for women. I certainly really uh, enjoyed the the commentary by Ms. Porter, and uh, I'm going to certainly embrace the her story month uh, for every March. So, sort of taking that theme, um, you know, um, it's not just me. Um, um, all the healthcare providers uh, at every level uh, they have been really committed and involved in responding to the pandemic and particularly during um, this last year, these uh, inequities for women uh, have you know, been further aggravated and uh, sort of much more in the forefront in front of us. Um, you know, I personally am very and passionate about um, affordable, accessible and uh, equitable care. Uh, that's been uh, um, a passion of mine throughout my career. Uh, and CVS Health, that's really a key driver for all of our work, uh, is reflected in, in the mission of the company and the principles. And in fact, to take it one step further, um, if I may, um, and it's that idea of keeping it personal, local, uh, and simple. Um, so uh, sort of aligned to that, um, we have been continuing our work during this past year. Now, you know, we recognize, I think all of us here uh, today recognize uh, the role women play, right? And the women play a, a really key role. They're like the chief medical officer of their own home, if you will, um, in seeking health care for their family uh, and, and also sometimes for their community. They're the ones who, who pick the provider, who pick the plan, who sort of play this, uh, this role. Uh, and also a woman's health care journey is really unique. It's, it's not the same at different ages and stages of her life. Um, and wo- a woman's health is much more than reproductive health, right? It's, um, but you do see that, uh, and literature shows this, that a majority of the women enter the healthcare system uh, for reproductive health. Uh, but a woman's health involves reproductive health, mental health, heart health, uh, episodic health care for infections, um, vaccinations, wellness checks, and so on and so forth. 
So in my work and the work of a lot of very, very talented colleagues here at CBS Health uh, and Aetna, um, we have been increasingly recognizing that uh, gender bias, you know, is prevalent in, in society um, on a societal and economic basis. But we're also beginning to ask uh, ourselves, and this is also in research, you know, how does gender affect healthcare? Uh, and what does it do to the healthcare outcomes? Uh, and that's sort of um, a key driving force to a lot of our work and efforts and different programs and solutions that we're coming up with here. We um, want to work uh, and focus on uh, developing a holistic approach to sort of close these gaps as it relates to uh, inequities in women's health care. So before I dive into, you know, um, what are we doing about it, it's important to understand really what is gender inequity in healthcare and how does it manifest? And I was talking about this with, I've been talking about this with family, friends, um, colleagues, and, and we have a lot of um, active conversations. And it's interesting uh, to me, I've really come to hone it down to two, two ways gender inequities manifest. The so first is in where, uh, you know, when ta how are, when patients are assessed, uh, diagnosed, and treated differently for the same symptoms based on their gender. So that's one way gender inequity manifests. The second is way that gender inequity manifests in healthcare, um, and and this is now backed by some research, uh, is when there's insufficient attention. Um, across medical specialties given to the sex differences in disease progression and treatment. Uh, and then when, when genders are not offered equal quality treatment for the same medical complaints, um, you know, naturally, as you can imagine, there are poorer outcomes. So let me give an example to sort of illustrate what I'm talking about, right? Um, and, and I'm just going to pick on a very a common um, condition, heart disease. Um, so go red. <laughs> um, so heart attacks are the leading uh, killer for American women. Uh, this has been known since 1984, and the mortality rate of heart attacks has been greater for women than men. But there's really, studies show that there's really no physical reason that women should die at a higher rate than men, right? Um, in fact, um, the American Heart Association publishes a journal and it finds that women, when women receive the same therapy as men, their chances of survival are, are exactly the same. So that's, then that leads us to the next assumption. So it's safe to assume that the increased danger in women dying from a heart attack is not um, because of their, their gender, but it's more, not because of heart attack themselves, but it's more, uh, the response to their heart attack, right? So therein lies the gender inequity in terms of how uh, women are being treated for a heart attack. The second piece where you know, there's this insufficient attention um, to the fact that we women manifest maybe things differently and therefore they need maybe a slightly different tailored treatment comes in the fact that it, heart attacks in women don't cause necessarily the same symptoms as men. And, uh, men oftentimes will have their crushing chest pain, uh, arm pain. Um, uh, women will oftentimes chalk up their symptoms and say, I just don't feel very well or, or heartburn or, or they'll attribute their symptoms to a muscle pull or stress. And then when they do go in and seek care providers, uh, when they're assessing these patients, assessing women patients, oftentimes they'll be looking for those very typical symptoms, if you will, you know, do you have chest pain? Is there crushing chest pain? Is it going down your left arm? Let, you know, uh, those types of things, but they're not necessarily looking for these uh, more uh, non-specific, what they call non-specific symptoms, but they're actually pretty typical to women, which is, you know, symptoms suggestive of reflux. And these patients are then given uh, a reflux, anti-reflux medication and sent home. And so therein comes in uh, gender inequity because insufficient attention is being paid to the gender differences of a common condition. Uh, and even if you look at media, you look at the TV ads and my nine-year-old picks on this, um, uh, when, when, when you sh when in media a heart attack is portrayed, it's often 
uh, with men and it's often with that crushing chest pain. So just even the messaging that is uh, being put out there. So women generally are not necessarily being educated, of, you know, that these atypical symptoms uh, such as reflux or nausea could be uh, signs and symptoms of possibly a heart attack. Um, similarly, uh, we need to do a better job in educating our medical professionals to look for these, you know, non-obvious symptoms such as, such as which are often attributed to acid reflux. So, you know, what I'm trying to get to is that gender inequities manifest in, in, in these two different ways um, uh, when, when we're talking about this. Couple other things which is really interesting as I was as I was looking at this is women uh, have a longer lifespan than men, right? So uh, and then women therefore experience uh, more age-related comorbidities, right? So they'll have um, higher disability, more osteoarthritis, more dementia. Uh, similarly, women are twice as likely to develop MS. They are they have a higher incidence of migraines. But if you look at how research is done um, and how commonly treated guidelines are made, these approaches are primarily made by research on men. Uh, and therefore, sometimes they're not as successful on women. So here is another example of gender inequity because insufficient attention is paid across medical specialties and in research um, to the sex differences in disease progression and, and treatment. So having outlined sort of what is what are the manifestations of gender inequity so that we're able to recognize them better, uh, it's really important that we, we continue to work on it because there's also economic impacts of this, you know. Um, uh, good primary health care for women, it doesn't not only promote economic stability, but it also is critical for limiting, co limiting costs in the healthcare system. So in our work here at CVS Health, and there's, uh, you know, multiple, multiple, many, many colleagues, teams, and multiple parts of the organization which are involved in this uh, work. We're really taking a very broad perspective. Uh, we're using very advanced analytics which are um, at our disposal. And we're developing solutions um, to deliver the appropriate care to the appropriate women um, at the right time. Uh, with the intention um, to have measurable, improved uh, healthcare outcomes. Uh, and this is across a spectrum of categories. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, just a one size fits all, if you will. So some of the categories that I'd like to outline, so it's, it's, you know, it's a navigation of the healthcare system. The healthcare system is certainly um, complicated um, and we are developing uh, appropriate tools to help women navigate uh, the healthcare system, get care when they need it, where they need it. It's in, um, you know, uh, care coordination. It's in engaging women with uh, certain specific programs. You know, we are thinking of programs um, at a community level, at a local level, at a provider level, and then um, at a health plan level. So there's uh, multiple uh, facets to this. And while we're doing this, we're also continuously thinking of having uh, culturally competent uh, conversations uh, with multiple channels of communication with our population at large. Uh, so this is sort of just a broad brushstroke on you know, how we think of gender inequities in healthcare um, and sort of what are our approaches, our broad brushstroke approaches in how we're thinking about uh, continually developing solutions uh, which are local, uh, simple, uh, and, and deliver the interventions that are needed. Thank you for um, like that historical, like just context and sharing uh, the scope of work that um, you uh, do within your um, everyday field. It was greatly, uh, greatly appreciated and greatly enlightening. Um, so moving on to Miss Joanne Lagonde, who gave us this amazing breathing exercise. And I would like to transition to talk about women's mental health. So according to uh, John Hopkins Medicine, um, women experience depression twice as often than men. So Ms. Joanne, as an educator and a mother, how have you personally observed the effects of women's mental health over the course of this long, long, long pandemic? Well, 
Oh, it has been long and <laughs> it has certainly been long and it has been a challenge to, um, and I'd like to share a presentation with you because tonight is going to be um, about me sharing a bit of my story with you as well, because we all have a story. As I was listening to um, Apana talk about uh, gender inequities and now put race on top of that. So I'd like to extend, we would all like to extend our hearts to the Asian women out there, to black women out there, to Hispanic women out there, Indian women out there, Native American women, like all of the women of all nations in our uh, white sisters who are there with us standing tall because we are the strength of our souls, right? We are the strength of the, the society. And with that, we suffer silently also. So when we talk about depression, it's real. It's not one in five, it may be five in five. It just depends on when it actually happens to us. For me, it started um, you know, after I had my son and I, and I suffered from postpartum, but I had no idea I was suffering from, from postpartum. And so on the right here, you can see that I look like a principal. I look <laughs> pretty well put together. And most of us women, that's what we do. We put our faces on. That's what we call it. We put our faces on and you have no idea what's under that face. And what was under that face, if you look in that middle picture, it was, um, was pain. Um, it was a sense of disconnect, disconnection. As a matter of fact, in 2014, the doctor, I had to go to a, a neurologist and neurosurgeon, and he shared with me that I had a benign tumor in my brain. Now, of all the places that I said God could put the tumor, he put, decided to put it in my brain, and I have a real relationship with my brain. Like for me, my brain is super, super special. Um, and for two weeks, though, I had to figure, um, the doctors and I had to figure out um, if it were benign or not, because of the location of where it was, it was very hard for them. Um, so. I, during the two week time period, I had to really face myself and say, okay, what am, I, what am I gonna do? But yet it didn't change my behavior. I worked overtime, I was taking care of my family as many of you are. So right now I wanna ask you this question, um, what roles are you playing in other people's lives? And how much space, how much time are you creating for yourself? See, even then, even then, being having to go to the hospital, uh, being with the neurosurgeon, it was like I had to take care of my family. I had to take care of my family. I had to take care of my school. I had to, I had to be. I had to be. I had to be. But did I really have to be? The my my tumor didn't scare me. What scared me was when I must have passed out in my car. I have no idea. I was having stroke-like symptoms, and and I hope that it doesn't come to that for you. I hope that you don't do not have to have a health scare like that because I was running away from myself. So I said in my car, I went to FedEx and I said in my car, before I was going in, I was just not feeling right. The left side, my left side was just going numb. I had a splitting headache. I mean, it was just, I was just not myself. I remember seeing the snow on the top of my windshield. And I just remember kind of waking up in the car. I, I, and I, had, I, was, I felt disoriented. So I drive myself to the hospital and thinking that it was my tumor. <laughs> they did every single test and the doctor said that I was suffering from chronic stress. I was angry. I was disillusioned. I couldn't believe it because I had been exposed to so many different strategies, meditation, yoga, but the, the issue was I didn't create space for me to actually engage in those practices every single day. And I'm here to tell you that you're worth that space because in order for us to take care of our mental health, we have to make space to take care of our mental health. I was teaching it, but I wasn't practicing it. There's a difference between being a teacher of something and being a practitioner of something. When you're a practitioner, you have power and you have a sense of accomplishment so for me, I had to change my lifestyle. That's the only thing that had to change. And thank God I had an opportunity to do that. So tonight is really a time for you to take a personal assessment on your own mental health. Successful women ask for help. We ask for help. I didn't know how to ask for help. I didn't feel that I could ask for help. 
I mean, after all, <laughs> right? I'm taking care of everybody. I have a building of uh, 1,400 people that I'm responsible for. I have employees under my care. I have students, I have families, I have communities, I have my own family. And we have friends when we're the strong woman, because you are a strong woman, everyone calls upon you. Everyone calls upon you. And you begin to suffer in silence. And so during this pandemic, so imagine before the pandemic, we were dealing with all of these issues. And now you have the pandemic where many women have to work from home or they, they have lost their jobs. What are we doing to ignite the joy in us? Have we lost our joy? Have we lost our connection? Have you lost your joy and your connection, right? So really take an assessment within and say, what do I need? What do I need in this moment? There's, this is not an accident that you're on this call, that you're on this webinar with us. This webinar is specifically designed for you to find space for yourself. So first of all, give yourselves a round of applause for being on here <laughs> and listening. That's right, that's right, you're here. And taking that moment. Today I'll be teaching you what I call the sacred seven practices that helped me to ignite my joy. That helped me to carve 30 minutes just for Joanne. Mm -hmm. Can you find 30 minutes just for you? I'm sure you can. I, you better, <laughs> right? We have 24 hours in the day. I'm not asking for an hour because that'd be too much for women. That'd be too much for us, right? I'm only asking you for 30 minutes. So what are you gonna do in those 30 minutes? That's every single day, lifestyle shift. Now, if you are suffering with depression, anxiety, or any additional mental health, and you need to see a therapist, I've seen one, let's go. You need a coach, you need someone to work with you and hold your hand, I'll be your guide. That's why we're here. You have an amazing resource here with Miss Jennifer Porter of DC. Raise your hand. Here we go. Let them know you're still here, right? <laughs> That's right. Text her, email her, let her know. Listen, as a matter of fact, put it in the chat right now. Let her know that we need to be able to step up what support you need right now in your life. So let's dive into these, uh, the sacred seven. I call them the sacred seven because I had to really go within and I really had to, to pray on this for me because I really felt I was losing touch with myself. I was losing, I was, I was disconnected to the people that I loved. I was giving, but I wasn't able to receive. And so through meditation and, 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 Practicing trial and error. Again, this is all about practice. This is all about daily practice. And working with women who are in similar situations like me, this is a tried and true system of joy, of creating space for yourself. So the first thing that I'd like to invite you to do is to grace your day with gratitude. So if you don't have a pen and paper, this is your time, my friends. <laughs> Let's do it. Grab a pen and paper. All right. What does it mean to grace your day with gratitude? I say that gratitude is actually the bridge to greater joy. Gratitude shifts your energy. It shifts everything in you. Have you ever had a bad day or you're having a bad moment and someone reminds you of something that you need to be thankful for or you found something you're like, wow. And all of a sudden your heart opens up. That's what gratitude does. So it's really important for you to just make a list of everything that you're grateful for, but don't do it occasionally. Do it once you wake up in the morning. I am so grateful for this day. I'm grateful for the sun. I'm even grateful for the rain sometimes, right? Like we're great. Oh, the sound of the rain. It's beautiful. Find something to be grateful for. Your family, your friends, whatever it is. I was in such a bad place that I was grateful for my toes. And then really... Realize that, well, if I didn't have my toes, how would I walk? And said, you know what? That's justifiable. I'm grateful for my fingers. I'm grateful. I'm great. What are you grateful for? I'm grateful for my eyes. Until you can expand it to say, I am grateful for where I am right now in life. Sometimes it's too challenging. It may be too challenging for you right now to say, I'm grateful for where I am in my life right now. But be grateful for your breath, right? So the first thing is grace your day with gratitude. 
The second thing is energy begets energy. You've got to move your body. Now, don't ask me to exercise for an hour. Remember, I only said for you to do 30 minutes. So <laughs> I'm sharing with you my tried and true system. I did research, okay? I have a shortcut. I did research and I found that 12 minutes of exercise every single day abides by the law of compound interest. <laughs> 12 minutes will get me to where I want to be. So I move my body. I love music. I love dancing. And so sometimes I do Zumba. Sometimes I just put music on and I start doing jumping jacks and silly moves and I move my body. So get your body into movement because it also sends endorphins into your system, you know, happy hormones to get your day started. How many of you, again, this is an assessment. So you really have to uh, take an assessment. How many of you move every day? How many of you really are mindful about what you're grateful for every day? And notice what it does to your system. Now, of course, be conscious of your breath and meditate. Now, being conscious of our breath, you see, your breath is connected to your body, your mind, and your emotions. Your breath has power. Your breath has so, so much power. Those of you who gave 100% to the two-minute uh, breathing exercise that we did, right? Do you notice how it shifted your entire system? Completely, completely. Just one deep breath, that's all you need to do. Just take one deep breath and release. And that one deep breath could help you make a better decision. That one deep breath could save you from ruining a relationship. One breath at a time, one breath at a time. So there's conscious breathing, right? Now, meditation is prolonged awareness, that sense of awareness. There, there are different types of meditation, and, and certainly um, later on, we'll be inviting you to the Sky Breath Meditation classes, and we're just so thankful. That's where I learned to meditate, through sky breathing practices, okay? So breath work and meditation, breathe. It's not that complicated. Start with five minutes. Again, we're working our way to 30 minutes, right? You have your gratitude, that's five minutes. You've got your, your moving your body, that's 12 minutes. And now I'm inviting you to breathe and meditate for five to 10 minutes. And just become aware of your breath. And move the attention from your toes to the top of your head. It's a body scan. And from the top of your head to the tip of your toes. Some of us, because we may suffer from anxiety or depression, we, we also suffer from an insomnia. It's like we can't escape it. So part of relaxing the body in the evening is just be, bring your awareness, just your attention, closing your eyes, laying flat on your bed, the arms outstretched. And all you have to do is bring your attention to different parts of your body, slowly moving from the, from the top of your head to the tip of your toes, from the tip of your toes to the top of your head. Okay, you're with me? All right. Number four, connect with others. Connection. Right now, we're in the midst of um, physical distancing. Physical distancing does not have to mean isolation. I was just on the phone with my aunt, um, my grand aunt, who, who I need to call more often. I called her and she was explaining to me how alone she felt and how alone she still feels because no one can come visit her. And it's real, it's real. During this time, we need to be more connected than ever. Make a phone call, send a text, send an email. You never know who that phone call is going to impact. And it may be you, you may be in need of that phone call. There are spaces for you to be taken care of. This is one of those spaces. This is one of those spaces. We're inviting you. Let's connect. And it's not just connecting with, with the people in your home. Sometimes it's hard to connect there. Let's connect. Con let's connect with the person who's walking by. Let's connect with the people really listening. Like, you know, when we used to ask, how are you? It's, it's almost like a loaded question. You're afraid. Like how many of you are afraid to ask, how are you doing? Right? You're like, <laughs> but when we ask, how are you? I'm inviting you to really listen, really listen to that person's story. 
because you listening to that person, not may, will save a life. So sometimes we're the ones giving the connection. Sometimes we're the ones in need of the connection. We're receiving the connection. And number five is one of my favorites, laugh out loud. I mean, make it up if you have to. What does that mean? That means put on that comedy, put on that comedy. Let's not take ourselves too seriously. Yes, we can laugh during a pandemic. Yes, we, there's a time under the sun for everything. What does that mean? It means that we have to come together even in time of struggle and celebrate together and hold each other and remind each other that we're still human. We're still here. Laugh at yourself. You make a mistake. So what? Everybody's making mistakes these days. Hello. That's who we are. That's okay. The, the goal here is when you laugh also, scientifically, you're changing the chemistry in your body. That's one. And second of all, you're giving, you're creating space in your mind to not be stuck to guilt and shame. There are two feelings that women are stuck to, guilt and shame. How do I know? I'm one of those people. We feel guilty not spending enough time. We feel guilty not being there for everybody. We feel guilty that we can't we have to go to work, then we have kids. Oh, we have to stay home. The baby's crying there and you have to be on Zoom and your boss wants you to smile and be present. That's right, smile. Well, hello, when are we gonna make it normal? We have kids, we're working from home. You are gonna hear the dog bark. The babies are going to be crying, right? So, so we have to all be able to come together and laugh at ourselves and laugh at each other and break up the silence so that we're not stuck to guilt and shame. And then once you feel that guilt, someone makes a comment, you feel ashamed. We feel like, oh, I mean, this is, this is, this is really bad. And once you get stuck in that feeling, you get stuck in a cycle. It's a cycle. Guilt and shame, guilt, no, no, no. Laugh at it, forget about it. Bye, Felicia. You gotta go right? Laugh at it and let's move on. And when we move on, I'd like for you to create an inventory of everything you love in life. Everything you love. What do you love to do? How many of you have forgotten what you love? I know I did. I was like, what's my favorite color again? Oh, pink and blue. But I could tell you everybody else's favorite color. How many of you and the men on the call Show curiosity, help us rediscover because as our, we feed ourselves, we can be more present. We can be more present. The sisters on the call, all of us sisters, we're all sisters regardless of our ethnicity, race, we're all sisters, we're all women. Let's come together and say, hmm, what are you doing for yourself today? That's another question. What are you doing for yourself today? Not just the Manny and Petty, right? What are you doing for yourself today? Give a compliment, feed yourself, compliment yourself. Tell yourself how amazing you are. Tell yourself, wow, you did a great job today, Joanne. That's right. Jennifer, by the way, sis, you did a wonderful job on that presentation. I love it. Oh my gosh. Dr. Martha, you are amazing. The way that you explain that gender inequity, it makes sense. Absolutely. But feeding ourselves, we can then feed others. What does that mean? I could be present to you. I could be of service because service also brings greater joy. And so I can't be present for you if I'm not present for myself because what happens is I get completely depleted. Then I begin to feel resentment towards those around me. But again, it's a kind of like a secret thing, right? So we begin to suffer in silence. And so I hope that these sacred sevens, I hope you wrote them down. And if you didn't, there's a replay. You can watch it again, I hope. <laughs> so remember that it's important to take care of yourself because caring for yourself is not about being self-indulgent. It's about self-preservation. 
It's about you being able to not only be there for everyone in your home, everyone in society, everyone in the world. Can there be a world without women? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And so to help you on this journey, Sky, Etna, and this wonderful Fit DC team has put together programs for you to continue rediscovering your breath. We create space for you to learn deeper breath, breathing practices, deeper meditations. And I'd like to invite you to watch this video with me. Welcome to the Breathe With Me movement. Our mission is to nurture and sustain a community of care, compassion, and justice. We offer tools to heal from stress, trauma, and the violence of systemic oppression, racism, and injustice. My name is Joanne. Breathe with me. 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 Breathe with us. Breathe with me. Breathe with me. Breathe with me. Breathe with me. So thank you so much, everyone. And remember to use your breath, lean on your breath. It is your strength. It is your power. And Women's History Month for me is every day, Dr. Blake, every day. We could just drop the mic right there. Um, Joanne, you gave a master class <laughs> on how to um, empower yourself, on how to elevate yourself, and how to encourage yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Although you thought you were talking to women, you were talking to me too. And I receive everything <laughs> that you have um, lifted up. And I'm going to try um, some of your seven um, best practices. As a matter of fact, Dr. Blake, I'd like to invite you to join my challenge. If you go to JoyceLeader.com, everybody, you can join the, uh, the seven day sacred seven challenge, JoyceLeader.com, because this is so important. Got it. Absolutely. 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 All right, so um, I have a question. I'm gonna take um, a moderator privilege uh, to ask this question. And uh, this question is for um, the, the participants that we have on the call that look and sound like me. Um, so for our panelists, how can men empower women every day along their journey? How can we be very intentional to support elevate, encourage, and empower women um, along their daily journey of life. Just give us, if one per, if each person give us one or two best practices or one or two tips on how we can compliment you all and how can we empower you all um, along your journey in life. You know, I'll start there. Um, uh, I'm a physician, but I'm also a mother of two. Uh, and like many of you, um, women have um, really bear the, the responsibility and, and the burden of caregiving. Uh, we care for, for our families, our children, our spouses, our pets, our parents, our communities, our neighbors, the elderly lady next door. And a caregiving stress um, is a real thing. Uh, which does impact women's health and their outcomes. So if I was to talk to my sons uh, or other male members in the community, uh, what I ask for them to, is to recognize um, that caregiver burden that's placed on women, that women take on to um, actively work to provide them some relief and actively provide the women that space to take care of themselves. Uh, to seek the health care, to help them navigate the system, uh, to take those 30 minutes that Joanne so eloquently talked about, uh, to find the 12 minutes to exercise and improve their heart health, 
uh, to take the baby aspirin, to take the prenatal vitamin, to go to the prenatal visit, um, you know, to find the exercise time for someone who suffered from arthritis. So if I was to, you know, just offer one suggestion uh, to um, people who look like you, <laughs> Dr. Blake, that, that would be the one thing I, I think would be huge for us. Recognize, recognize the caregiving burden, got it, thank you. I'll share, I, I love this question and I love the, the spirit behind this question because uh, as Dr. Mathur uh, shared, so many women and, and she shared a statistic that reminded me of another statistic that um, men who, I mean, married, uh, marriage is actually a protective factor for the life of men, meaning that the women in their lives actually extend, if you look statistically, extend their lives. And so the the spirit behind figuring out how we can, how you can support us knowing that we are protective factor for your life is important um i uh, am happily married have been married for almost 5 years uh and one of the things that my husband really has done for me to support me and my health is just being an example of radical self care and I may make you laugh with this, but sometimes as women, we are boundless. And that's in a good way and a bad way. And uh, Joanne hit, oh, I just honor you, <laughs> Joanne. You hit on so many um, critical things about this because we can go all day. And sometimes I was sharing earlier today, one of the most radical things that I did was to use the bathroom because I had been Zooming all day. And why is that radical? Why is self-care radical? Why is taking care of our health radical for women? Because sometimes those boundaries are hard for us. We're givers, we're nurturers, and we can't turn it off. And I, I, I remember one day I had asked my husband to do something, something around the house and I got home and I had volunteered with the sorority and fed the homeless and I had taught, taught at the school and I had done all these things. And my husband was, you know, kind of chilling out on the couch and, you know, playing his video games. And I was like, you have one thing to do. And he was like, I'm going to get to it. And, and in my comparison, I was like, I've done all these things. I've fed the homeless. I've went to the food bank. And, and his response to me, which was so simple, but it was radical. It was the thing that, that you've asked me to do, I'm going to get to it. But my, but I did not commit those things. All of those things that you put on your plate, <laughs> those are things that you actively chose to do. And so my husband, he'll just say, sit with me. And, and as simple as that is, just being able to recognize um, all of the, the things that we have to overcome. You know, sometimes it's, it's within our own, the identity, the things that we're carrying, just being able to encourage us to take that breath. like like. Um, like Joanne mentioned, being able to encourage us just to slow down sometimes. And sometimes it's encouraging us to have those healthier boundaries with our family and with commitments that, that we've made. And so that for me is really is where I think our male counterparts, you all get it. You all get it. You all can commit to uh, relaxing and, and, and chilling. And that is something that is it's so balanced. And I think that women really can, can learn that from you all. <laughs> I I couldn't agree more, Jennifer. I couldn't agree more. And it's it's one of the things I had to I had to learn as well. And, and my husband helped me to get that is dishes in the sink and doing all of that and have to clean. I have to clean. I have to and he stopped me. He was like, listen, how many kids do we have? And we have a dog. All right. Just stop. Do, does this have to be done right now? And I think the other thing that we all have to think about is um, intentional acts of kindness. The intent, being very intentional and, and really listening. Um, what does she want? Rather that, that, sh that, that she that we're referring to is the woman in your life as, uh, as present as your wife, your partner, as present as your girlfriend, as present as your mom, as present as your sister, as present as your daughter. Each woman has a personality. Pay attention to her. Don't bring me flowers if I'd prefer 
ice cream. On a bad day, bring me my ice cream and don't mention how many calories it has. And yes, I will eat the whole thing. Yes, don't question that. It's really super, it's really that simple. I think just as simple, as much as we say women are complicated, we just want what we want. And that's it. So when you bring us what we want, we're okay. And, and I think part of the reason why sometimes men have trouble with women is because you don't pay attention. Pay attention. Listen, you know, and say, wow, you know, she woke up extra early today. What's the intentional, intentional act of kindness? We say random act of kindness. I don't like anything that's random. First of all, I know as leaders, especially as women leaders, we don't like surprises to begin with. <laughs> so if it's not a surprise that I want, <laughs> you know, that's really, uh, that's a bit of a problem. However, if it's really intentional, it could just be with a simple note. It could just be, I got the kids ready. It could be a simple phone call, a simple text, and a simple act of service. Sometimes all of the flowers, all of the candy, the dishes are still in the sink. Um, this needs to be vacuumed. It seems like it's like hard work, right? But the thing is, if who was gonna do it? <laughs> Sometimes that's the best way to show love, right? Who's gonna do it? If no one else does it, who in the house normally does it? Let me know in the chat right now, how many women or right now, if no one else is doing it, who's doing it? <laughs> You're looking at her. So I love, I, there we go. Look at all these raised hands. Come on. I know there's more. I know there's four. <laughs> Keep those numbers coming. Let Dr. Blake and all these men, all the men who are on this call know. That's right. This chat is blowing up, Dr. Blake. <laughs> you are amazing. We love you. Thank you for representing the men because all we want is that intentional act of kindness. <laughs> wow. Guess what? You all have just extended my marriage an additional 50 years because I want to take all of the notes that you have given, um, shared on tonight um, to, uh, uh, to apply. Um, as we end off, uh, I definitely want to um, talk, have a, not a conversation, but get your, your, your thoughts around, around equity. So normally when we talk about inequities, we normally refer to the differences in privilege around race, um, most notably around white and black. But there are also gender equity that is very prevalent in society today. Um, and uh, the, the differences between male privilege and female privilege. Um, in a perfect world, um, what, do you, how do, what do you all believe on what does society needs to do to disrupt gender prejudice, gender bias, um, gender discrimination, so that all of us can thrive and be acknowledged for our talents, for our, ex our expertise, and just be acknowledged as human beings in, um, in this great nation. So in a perfect world, what do we need to disrupt for that to happen? Take action. I think sometimes we depend on um, people's thoughts to change. Take action. Put a woman in office and see what she will do. You will never know until she's in office. You will never know until that power is there. And it's not because we haven't um, earned it. We've earned it. We have absolutely earned it. And so it's, it's, it's about, for me, no more talk. Take action. You know, from a healthcare standpoint, um, the healthcare industry certainly is um, working to address gender inequities. Uh, it, it's not something which is going to happen overnight, but certainly there is progress being made. Um, so, you know, I talked about this earlier. Women age; they have natural life transitions, right? Um, they have um, this, you know, have the reproductive life, and they have menopause. Um, they've acquired different types of care and attention from primary care health providers. And then as they age, they need uh, some more specialty services because of some of those conditions that we talked about earlier. Um, so it is, the healthcare industry is beginning to recognize this, uh, this gap for women 
uh, as they're going through these different ages and stages in their lives and is beginning to really put an initiative into place um, to, to promote primary health care, uh, realizing that it's, it's really that a robust primary health care system, which is going to significantly help close this gap uh, and optimally serve uh, the needs of women across these different stages. Now, literature also sort of talks about three things to be very aware of when you're developing uh, these types of solutions to address gender in uh, inequities and disrupt uh, what's been going on, is to sort of keep three things um, in mind, front and center, as you're developing their solutions. So one, it needs to be gender-specific care or, or also known as sex-specific care. So that means the care needs to be related to the health needs of women. Uh, such as pregnancy, menopause, uh, a girl starting her periods, uh, needing birth control. So it needs to be gender specific care. Uh, so while it's important to you know, improve primary care across the nation, across all facets, but this is, we need to keep this front and center. It needs to be gender aware care. And, and that means care for conditions that are diagnosed or treated differently um, in women compared to men. We talked about heart disease earlier, Let's talk about migraines, migraines as it's related to uh, women's reproductive cycle, uh, talk about neurodegenerative diseases. We talked about multiple sclerosis. So again, gender aware care, how do you care for conditions that um, uh, are diagnosed more frequently perhaps in women or maybe need a little bit of a different treatment path? Be aware of those treatment modalities. And then it needs to be gender sensitive care. So we talked about gender specific, gender aware and then gender sensitive care. So gender sensitive care now is a little bit more broader where it means uh, care which is provided in ways that's inclusive of gender specific preferences. So whether that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, uh, asexual, all their health needs. So, you know, the industry is certainly responding with a more robust primary care solutions outside of the traditional primary care setting with these three pillars in mind of um, gender specific, gender aware, and gender sensitive care. And in terms of more specifics and response, you know, I talked about um, the importance of access to care and the pandemic really highlighted this. It really impacted the access to care and more so for women along every metric, whether it was reproductive health, it was access to birth control, it was a pregnancy health, mature, it was mental health, chronic health. In every, every metric, the pandemic uh, further aggravated the inequity that's seen in healthcare, particularly for women. And one of the responses, which is therefore very key, is improving that access um, and, and to affordable, good quality care. And for that, the industry is creating entry points into care, which is outside of the four walls of the hospital or the hospital system. Uh, and retail health is, is a big example of that, right? From Walmart or CVS. So just for, you know, for CVS Health, the, the Minute Clinic uh, offers expanded services. There's services on women's health, on immunizations, well, well checks, uh, travel health, um, minor injuries, uh, and then uh, in, in some of our locations where the health hubs are being built out, there's facilities for pelvic exams um, and a lot more women's health services. Uh, there is um, some, a program called uh, the First Pregnancy Visit where, you know, there, and this was particularly important during the pandemic where, you know, as, as an unintentional consequence where uh, because of lockdowns and shutdowns and elimination of office hours, women had difficulty accessing maternity care. So in developing this solution, which is outside the traditional hospital office walls, um, there are now the offering of uh, the first pregnancy visit at a much more accessible point. Um, many states are allowing for pharmacists um, within their licensing um, guidelines to provide uh, provide care. And, and um, there's also, and this was again amplified during the pandemic, you know, it, necessity is the mother of innovation and the pandemic certainly showed us that. There were virtual platforms to, to obtain um, birth control and, and during the pandemic, um, these certainly took off and women did access those a lot more. So 
in the industry is certainly working um perhaps not as quickly but it's it's focused on this where it is trying to disrupt uh these gender inequities and provide care i'll give you one more example um of a prevention focused approach um of to care and, and this is again an example which you know um teams are our colleagues are really proud of at cvs health and this is to do with preeclampsia prevention um just to sort of come out of doctor speak, preeclampsia is is a hypertension which occurs during pregnancy, uh, and it, it can really have some very poor outcomes for for mother and baby. So it's um, you know it, it can be a pretty complicated thing. The pandemic and the lack of uh, care for maternal health really complicated a woman's journey even further uh, in terms of diagnoses and access to treatments. Now, the interesting thing is that um, the prevention of preeclampsia is a really very, very simple solution. It's, it's a low-dose aspirin, which is available almost anywhere and everywhere. And so in our, um, within the teams at CVS Health, they looked at using uh, very sophisticated data analytics, they were able to predict women who might be impacted with this and they were able to de deliver a very tailored solution uh, to those women um, to in, in a in sort of a package educational kit if you will so that the patients could be more aware could be informed and talk to their doctors about it and use this very simple intervention using uh, data and education uh, to prevent a very very serious condition so there's multiple responses uh, which are occurring um, uh, at, 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 in the healthcare industry uh, in terms of um, you know the brick and mortar facilities where pa where patients can go and get care in terms of uh, digital innovation where education uh, and care coordination can be delivered uh, use of analytics to develop some tailored interventions. Uh, and uh, you know, I feel all of these uh, these interventions will certainly, certainly uh, help us uh, push the needle um, in terms of disrupting these inequities for care. I think uh, I think that was powerful, and I think that you hit the nail on the head in terms of the structural uh, things that um, can contribute to equity. I want to just answer this from an internal perspective uh, for women, because I think the more that we are identifying the, the systematic, the policy and the structural changes that need to be made uh, when it comes to gender equity, I think a big part of the work that we have to do is internal. Being bold and speaking up, finding our voice. And sometimes it's not even finding it, it's really, it's really um, projecting that voice. I love that Joanne talked about that, that personal assessment. And I, I try to even take that a step further um, in my journey. And I'm thinking about my, my personal self audit because the assessment is looking at what's there. I, I don't know what I may find, but the audit is saying, what are you doing what you said that you're doing? Are you showing up in a way that you say that you are? And women, we are bold. We are change agents. We are leaders. Um, and when it comes to our health, we know, we know a lot of the things that we need to do. We know a lot of the ways that we need to show up. But very rarely do we take that reflection that Joanne was talking about, take the time to do that, to really do a self audit and say, are we showing up in the ways that we say we are? We do a great job of showing up, but are we showing up how in, in healthy ways, when we look at the unhealthy boundaries and unhealthy relationships that we're continuing to be in, when we look at does my out the outside of my body, how beautiful I'm dressed and how I show up, does it match my insides, the things that I'm eating, the sleep, uh, drinking water, those movements and health practices, we know what, what we need to do. But the system um, very often contributes to us maintaining some of those unhealthy standards, but also maintaining um, uh, of not having that audit. And so I, I just want to encourage all the women on, and I want to encourage us to continue to do that internal work to make sure that we're asking that question in all of our facets, in our careers, in our relationships, 
and within our health, because when we when we start to have that conversation, that's when we find our voice, realizing that this toxic uh, work environment or toxic relationship is adding to my chronic stress or the health habits or even access to health in my community needs to change and we find our voice. And so I really do think that um, women need to continue to do that assessment and do that audit of, of how we're showing up internally and continue to do the work externally. And I think we uh, we move forward when we meet somewhere in the middle. Jews, Jews, Jews. I'm loving all the Jews that are being dropped here tonight. We have a question in our, Q, in our Q&A portion. Uh, man, anyone could take a stab at it. Um, what, are, what are ways we can advocate for ourselves in healthcare? Are there standards of care we should look out for? What should our expectations be after having so after having so many years of being ignored? That's a great question. Uh, thank you for that. You know, at this point, I, I we as as other panelists, Jennifer and Joanne, have pointed out. Um, if we as women are more cognizant of our healthcare needs and, and are willing to ask the questions and take care of ourselves, I think the battle is half won. I'll share a statistic with you from the Kaiser Family Foundation where they did a study on the impact of the pandemic of women accessing healthcare through telehealth. Now you all know that telehealth exploded during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to me is, um, Women and men both accessed health, uh, telehealth healthcare. Women accessed it for infections or small acute symptoms. Um, men accessed it for chronic health conditions. So, you know, their high cholesterol and diabetes follow ups. Uh, overall, both were equally satisfied, but in general, women, you know, they did not access care for their chronic health care needs. Uh, so that tells you a little bit something, right? Um, in terms of advocating for oneself, and I'll give you another statistic. Uh, when we look at the impact of the pandemic, uh, there is almost 38% of women compared to 26% of men who skip preventive healthcare services. So again, um, it's some of the, it's some of this is sort of just as others have pointed out, you know, taking a pause and allowing us ourselves that space, uh, the time uh, to to make that investment within ourselves. Um, there, there's almost double the amount of women who have been reported to be splitting pills in half. So all of these statistics of what they're telling us that, and, and it's also actually one in five women who are, who are fair or poor health they are the ones who are not filling prescriptions, who are skipping doses. Um, and this data is, is very clearly showing the difference between how um, men and women are accessing care. So I'm, while it's important to sort of think about standards of care, but in general, um, I feel before we get to looking at the different standards of care, it's just important for us to start thinking about how we're accessing care and utilizing it to the fullest extent possible. Certainly educating ourselves, educating our daughters and sisters in the community, asking the questions, advocating for each other is going to go a long, long way. Uh, but the number one piece which is going to really impact this for now as a, as a starting uh, is that access to care and, and utilizing it. Got it. Do we have a new visitor with us, um, Ms. Porter? <laughs> Do. Good evening. Multitasking here. <laughs> love, it, love it. Love it. Well, uh, that ends our engagement session on um, this evening. Uh, Ms. Porter, uh, Ms. La uh, Ms. Lagande, and Dr. Mathorne, we greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate the, the value, the expertise, and the strategies that you all provided um, for women on, on tonight. Um, we honor each of you and I honor each of the women on the call tonight as we continue to celebrate uh, Women's History Month. And let's make it a movement to not only let March 
be the only month dedicated to acknowledging and honoring your, your brilliance, honoring your, your, your skill set and the value that you have to our communities. So for that, on behalf of all of the men in the world, we say thank you, thank you, thank you. I will now pass it um, back to my colleague, Mr. Marcus Duckworth, as he provides some closing remarks. Uh, th thanks so much, Dr. Blake. Um, I think you echoed my, my sentiment exactly. This was a fantastic and timely discussion. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed it just as much as I did. And on behalf of CVS Health and Aetna, I'd like to again thank our wonderful and esteemed panelists for an open energetic dialogue and all of their wonderful wisdom and insight that was bestowed upon us this evening. Uh, thanks to our moderator as well for framing the discussion and, and thanks to all of you who attended and engaged with us tonight. Um, we hope that you'll take this information to heart and use it often and use it often with purpose. So that concludes tonight's discussion. Uh, thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Welcome to the Breathe With Me movement. Our mission is to nurture and sustain a community of care, compassion, and justice. We offer tools to heal from stress, trauma, and the violence of systemic oppression, racism, and injustice. My name is Joanne. Breathe with me. 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 Breathe with us. Breathe with me. Breathe with me. Breathe with me. Breathe with me.